What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to Sis Hawk Talk on Melrose. Thank you for tuning in. I am Colin. Tyler will be joining me a little bit later. Not going to lie to you, the plan was to do a short Iowa football, just a little talk before Tyler gets on as we talk more basketball towards the back end of this episode. And I was going to give you my storylines as we enter spring ball, which starts tomorrow, March 20th. And here we are, as I'm hitting record about five minutes ago, Caden Proctor decides that he is no longer with Iowa football and that he's transferring yet again and going back to Alabama more than likely. A complete shock, and I guess we're going to talk about that now. And it's going to be all raw because, like I said, it just happened. And it, you're going to hear my initial thoughts right away. Like, I haven't even had time to even think about it. So we're going to start with that, and then we'll get into – some storylines as we enter spring practice. Now, once again, if you go on Twitter, you would think the world has fallen apart and Iowa football is doomed. And it's not one guy doesn't define a football program, but it does suck. And let's start with that. Let's start with what Caden Proctor brought to Iowa, right? So when he committed or transferred to Iowa two months ago, we were bringing in a guy that had obviously um, SEC experience, right? He was graded his best game against Georgia, a dominant football program in the SEC championship, right? So you're bringing in a guy with a lot of experience, a lot of potential. He was going to elevate our position group really good, even though we were pretty much bringing back everybody on the offense line. Just him alone was going to elevate that position group. I don't think anybody could lie about that. Like that was going to happen more than likely. And obviously, so that's number one. And and it sucks. Like I, I, I think some people might play off that, you know, it's not a big deal. And to me, like it is right. Like we were really excited for him to come in. There was a reason he's a five-star former five-star started in all the games last year for Alabama, for Nick Saban as a freshman reasons to be excited. But I will say this. I think it speaks a lot to his character to essentially well, number one, screw Iowa over twice because he screwed Iowa over the first go around when he, you know, signed with Iowa and then right up until the signing period decides to go Alabama. At that time, for me, like I was mad, but I understood it in a way. It's like, you know what? He's a kid from Iowa. He gets the opportunity to go to Alabama. Like, it is what it is. But this second time, it's way different, right? You you leave Alabama, you come to Iowa. You get a big NIL, and now who knows, right? Who knows if he's, you know, all the money that he got from the Swarm for the NIL, like he's going to get all that money right now because we don't really know, right? We don't know if he got a large sum right away or if it was broken out in installments, and if that's the case, he obviously won't. Uh, So we don't really know that, but I'm sure he probably got some money, right? And so he pretty much came to Iowa, got the money, and kind of left and just left us high and dry before spring ball even started. Like he hasn't even stepped on the field yet. And it's just crazy to me because we sit here now and it's like, what happened? Like, what happened? What changed in two and a half months? You come to Iowa, you're all excited to come back to Iowa. You keep saying it's home. And then two months later, you're done. Like, you leave. Before, like I said, before spring ball even starts. Like, what happened? I think a lot of people are going to mention, like, oh, he's probably, like, doesn't want anything to do with this offense. He probably wants nothing to do with, you know, maybe whoever the quarterback's going to be, if, you know, if it's not going to be, you know, if Kate's hurt or whatever, or even if it is Kate, like, like who knows, but I will say this though. We, we haven't even stepped on the field yet. We haven't even started spring ball yet. All it's been is winter workout. So you can't really use that as like, Oh, he's, that's probably why he's leaving. There has to be more to the story. If I would have to guess there has to be more, but once again, for me, it, it really comes down to like the character of the guy. And at the end of the day, like, Iowa football is built on culture. It's built on guys buying in. And essentially, we don't need that, right? Now, like, yes, I would love to have Keenan Proctor on our team, right? Because he's good, and he would make our offensive line position much better. But when you're talking character, when you're talking those type of things, we don't need that in the locker room. We don't need that cancer in the locker room. Not one guy is above the rest of the program. And Kirk Ferentz has built a very good program in Iowa City. 
right? One on really good culture. And I'm sorry, but if you got a guy like that who's just like it's just weird to me. Like it's really weird to to leave and then two months later go back to where you were at. Like you're pretty much like adios, right? Like it's just so weird to me. And I just think it's like, you know what? At the end of the day, yes, it sucks, but if that's really who he is, then I guess goodbye. See you later. Good luck at Alabama. Not really, but have fun. Like that's kind of where I'm at now with it. Like it sucks ass. It really does. I think we can all agree as Iowa fans, this sucks ass. It's almost like, wow, we just, we're just we not even going to start, start spring ball yet, and like we've already got our heart sunk a little bit. Like, yes, it sucks ass. But at the end of the day, like, we'll be fine. Like, we'll be fine. It's, we're not going from potentially a good season to, okay, now we're probably never going to, we're not going to win many games because one guy leaves. Like, he hasn't even played a snap at Iowa. Like, you can't even say that, right? So we just got to move on from it. It, it. It's it's just it's stupid. The whole NIL thing, the whole transfer portal is dumb. The fact that you can just do that is is ridiculous. I think if if you transfer within the same season, let alone two and a half months, there should be a penalty for that. There should be okay, you have to sit out a year or you lose a year of eligibility. There needs to be something. There needs to be a collective bargaining agreement in the in college. There. The game that we once love is turning into a joke. And I hate that because college football is my favorite sport. But it's slowly, as the years go on, if this continues to happen, it's going to be hard to really love this game. It really is. Because it's not just going to affect Iowa. It's going to affect a lot of teams. And you, you've already seen it, right, with so many other teams. It really sucks. So I guess that's all I have for that. and. You know, as we move on, as we get, you know, the days go on, we'll probably learn more about the different situations and um, probably more stuff will come out. But as of right now, that's really all we know. And that's kind of all I have for that. So let's get into the Iowa storylines I that I had going into spring ball. One of them was Caden Proctor. So I guess we'll just cancel that out. But I think the, the biggest storyline for Iowa is how will the offense look under Tim Lester? I think that's the the biggest thing. And I am not, I'm going to say it right now, I'm not going to get my hopes up. I'm going to wait until the first game to really say, yes, I believe that things are going to look different. I believe this offense is going to look better because the last how many years, right, we have thought, we have we heard the noise, and it was the same thing. Now, What's a little bit different this year is we don't have Brian Ferentz, right? We have Tim Lester. And the hope is, not saying it's going, the hope is that he is going to come in and instill a better offense with a updated scheme, with better route trees, which it does sound like those things have happened. There's going to be more motions, things like that. Snap cadences, snap cadences and all that is, is all changed from what I've read. Now, does that make our offense better? I don't know. And I'm not going to say it because once again, I, I looked like a fool the last how many years getting my hopes up, making it seem like, okay, things are going to change. It's going to look better. And then it's the same old bullshit. So we got to wait to see to believe, but we can be hopeful, right? As Hawkeye fans, that things are going to change. And in for spring ball, like I'm just curious to see what it looks like right now. I will warn people that especially when we get to like the spring game on April, what 20th, it might not look great, but just relax, right? Because it's only spring ball, and Lester's only been here for like two months. The same, you know, the same amount of months that Caden Proctor's been here. So very short and sweet, right? So we we gotta be patient. And for me, it's just like I, I'm gonna look at certain things, see what is a little bit different, and then just kind of go from there. Uh, number two, the quarterback room. How will it look now that we actually have a legit quarterbacks coach? I think Kirk Ferentz has made two really bad decisions in his uh, coaching career at Iowa. Number one, hiring Brian Ferentz as offense coordinator. But I don't even think that was the worst. I think the worst was hiring him as the quarterbacks coach, a guy that's never coached quarterbacks, guy has never played at the quarterback position. And we saw the dramatic decrease in quarterback production 
ever since he's stepped foot as quarterback's coach, it's gone just completely downhill. And for me, like, having Brian Ferentz leave, like, I was happy about it because of the offense. But I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I was extremely happy, too, because finally, like, okay, we actually now have a legit quarterback's coach. Tim Lester played quarterback. He coached quarterback position before. He has the experience. And I'm just curious to see how the quarterback room will look. I have really no hope in Deacon Hill like at all, and I hope he never steps foot on the football field again. But once again, I'm going to be curious to see, does he improve a little bit under Tim Lester? Does Marco improve? I think if the season started today, Cade would obviously be the starter, but if he's hurt, it, I, I'm sure it will be Marco. I'm curious to see if we go out after spring ball and get another quarterback in the transfer portal. The only problem with that is, I really think that we probably won't find a great quarterback because I don't think any quarterback is going to want to come here with Cade being the starter. So you're going to find probably a middle of the pack type of guy. But I think we might need that. Because I think we all know what Deacon Hill is made of, right? And we we know that Cade been back to back season ending injuries. Can we rely on him? I'm hoping. Like I hope right now that he plays every game next year. But you can't rely on that. So we got to have a backup. Can Marco take that next step? Can Tim Lester develop him? I thought he played okay in the in the bowl game, considering you know he hasn't really had much experience. Can he take that next step? That would be huge. Number three, who emerges at running back? Now, number three is that, and number four, which was Caden Proctor, I'm putting who emerges at wide receiver then. So I'm just going to put that there. But at running back, I really like the running back room and Caleb Johnson, LaShawn Williams, and Jaswell Patterson. You go back to last year, LaShawn Williams really took that next step because Caleb Johnson just frankly got hurt at the beginning of the year and just never really quite was the same as the year went on. Kind of sucked. He had that really good run against Illinois to kind of win that game. He had that good run against Purdue. But outside of that, really, really just not a good sophomore year. Um, Had a great freshman year. I'm really hoping he can take that next step. Now, if you look at like Tim Lester's offenses, like at Western Michigan, uh, the running back room, they, they had a thousand yard rusher almost every single year. Um, the formations that he ran there really utilized the running backs and got them into space and things like that. So I'm hoping that's what we can do. And I think Caleb Johnson has a potential um, if we run sort of similar formations like Tim Lester ran at Western Michigan, I think he has the opportunity to do good. And I, and I really like LaShawn Williams. The biggest question for me is, will one of these guys transfer after spring ball? Because I think after spring ball, one of the guys will know like, yeah, I'm buried in the depth chart. I, I'm not going to be the main guy. And I'm going to really wonder, like, I'm honestly surprised all three are staying. I thought for sure the minute the season was over with, one of those three guys, if not two of the three guys, was going to leave. And I was just shocked that all three were staying. That speaks volume to, um, I guess, the program, and that speaks volume to the running backs coach, who right now I'm having a brain fart on who it is, but I know who it is. Liddell Betts. I just have to I just have to think. It's what sucks about doing podcasts by myself is you're constantly thinking, and sometimes you forget names, but yeah, Liddell Betts, it speaks volumes to Liddell Betts because to be able to keep those guys. But once again, we have to wait and see because we just talked about Caden Proctor. It just goes to show how crazy the transfer portal is and NIL and all those things. So you never know. Um, and then number four, kind of branch off of that, who emerges at wide receiver? I mean, for me, I really, really love Caleb Brown. I, I am hopeful for Seth Anderson. If you go back and you look at Tim Lester's career at Western Michigan as a coach, and I talked about this on the podcast with Colby a few weeks ago, you know, he found some diamonds in the rough and made them really good. Sky Moore, Jalen Reed, who then transferred to Western or to Michigan State, now at the Packers, D. Eskridge, guys like that. Um, I can't think of the one wide receiver that went to Minnesota, but what all those guys had in common were they weren't really highly rated and Tim Lester like found potential in them and like he had targeted them a lot. Like all those guys had a lot of career receptions. And um, especially like Sky Moore, for example, and he's kind of like fits a mold like Caleb Brown. So I expect Caleb Brown to have a really, really big year upcoming. Now he needs to do a better job at catching the ball. There was a few drops last year towards the back end of the season when he started playing a lot more. Uh, but if he can fix that, I think he's poised to have a huge year. And I think Tim is going to really find ways to get him involved because at the end of the day, he's like our most athletic dude on the field and you got to get the most athletic dudes, the ball. Um, and then Seth Anderson for me, like last year, it's so crazy how 
he got that first touchdown, the second snap of the game or the third snap of the game. And we probably all at the time were like, wow, this guy's going to be a stud for us. And then he really didn't do anything the rest of the year. I think he has potential, but once again, can he take that next step? And you saw towards the back end of the year, he didn't even really even play at all. And then outside of those two guys, it's really nobody, right? And I'm not saying that like they, it's like we have really bad players behind them. What I mean by nobody is we have no experience. You have Jacob Bostic, who's constantly hurt, but I think has potential. And then you got Jarrett Bowie and Dane Howard, who are both freshmen last year. So, you know, they just don't have the experience either. Now, Dane Howard, he's kind of a guy that I have circled because we need an exposition player. Wide receiver, ex wide receiver, a guy that's six three, six four, and Dane Howard six four, six five. Um, but the problem with him though is no experience, so we have to wait and see. That is one position group that I hope we target with quarterbacks in the second wave of the transfer portal come spring ball after spring ball. I think we really need to get another wide receiver. If you told me right now that two months from now, hey, we found a wide receiver in the portal, a guy that has some experience, you know, he has some decent stats at this school he's six three ish six four i'd be really happy i'd be like, okay here we go okay we got him we got caleb brown we got seth anderson jacob boston we got our tight ends we're good um but i'm a little worried about that um and then number five for me switching to the defensive side of things because obviously we talked offense and that's going to be the main storyline for spring ball is the offense really for me for defense bringing back pretty much everybody there's really not many question marks but really it's comes down to like defensive line depth, right? Like I like our our starting four, Deontay Craig, Ethan Herkett, um, like Aaron Graves, and then Yahweh Black. I love those guys. I love some of the backups, Brian Allen, Max Llewellyn, um, Jeremiah Pittman. Like those guys are good. But then outside of that, who's going to step up? Obviously losing Joe Evans, Logan Lee. They were really good guys. And I think they're both going to make NFL rosters. So um, I like, the, the four the starters, but we got to have guys that can come in and back them up. And like I said, I just named three guys that are going to be backups, but you need more than that. Right. And then at corner, you know, we all kind of thought Jamari Harris kind of didn't have a great year last year. Now we have to remember in 2022, he said, you know, he was hurt the entire year. This last year, he didn't play the first two games. And if you think about it, most teams that played Iowa last year, kind of attacked him because they weren't going to attack Cooper Jean, who was really good and going to be a first rounder. Like, why would you, excuse me, why would you do that? So they targeted him and he just had an up and down year. He had some nice time, nice plays here or there. And then there were times where he did not look very good. Can he take that next step? I'm glad he's back. And then Deshaun Lee. Now with him, you know, it always sucks when there's injuries and, you know, like in this case, last year's suspensions, but then when you fast forward, you're, you're, you're still not like, okay, I'm glad that happened because like you never want to wish an injury on somebody, let alone like, you know, Cooper Jean, but at least gives a guy like experience now, because think about it, like if, if Jamari Harris didn't get suspended the first two games and Cooper Jean, you know, if, if he didn't get hurt, like Deshaun Lee doesn't play at all last year, right? He didn't. And think about the experience he got those first two games against Utah state who, was a very like spread you out type of team. And then going on the road at Ames against Iowa state major experience. And then towards the back end of the season, when Cooper Jean got hurt, he had to come in. So I'm, I'm glad he got the experience, right? I would be feeling a little bit more worse about things of like Deshaun Lee had did not play at all last year. And it was mainly just Jabari Harris, but at least you got two guys that has experience. Then you have TJ Hall and John Nestor behind them. Now, John Nestor is another guy that I've been hearing a lot of good things about. So we'll have to wait and see on that. But um, when you look at the defense, those are mainly my two things that I'm going to really watch this spring is the corner, especially at cornerback depth and the defensive line depth is really the big thing. So, um, yeah, th so those are kind of my five storylines. Um, I'm excited for spring ball. Obviously, with this whole Caden Proctor news, is is kind of made things a little kind of sucky, but I think we'll all move on from it. It is what it is. It sucks. Don't get me wrong. It sucks ass, especially if the reports are true that, you know, the, with the whole NIL money. And, and like I said, I don't really want to talk much about that because we don't really know if that's, you know, how much money he's just pocketing and like leaving us high and dry. Like we don't really know for sure, but regardless, the, the entire situation is very shitty and it really sucks. But once again, I'm still, excited for this next year. I still think this team has a lot of potential and, and, and don't get me wrong. 
The offensive line, too, if you think about it, even with Caden Proctor leaving, like we're bringing back pretty much everybody. Mason Richmond, left tackle, he started last year. Right tackle's probably going to be Jennings Dunker. He started last year at right tackle for us. Center is going to be either Logan Jones or Tyler Ellsbury. Both played. And then guard position, it's going to be Connor Colby, um, probably Tyler Ellsbury if he doesn't start center. Maybe it's Bo Stevens. Maybe it's Nick DeJong. It's going to be one of those guys. So we have the experience. It's not like we don't. It's not like we were losing like three guys because they were graduating and we're bringing in, in, you know, we're bringing Caden Proctor and then now he's leaving. It's like, oh my God, we only have like one or two starters. No, like all these guys played last year. So it's not like the offensive line is going to be like trash. Now they do need to step up because the last few years it's been bad. Now last year was a little bit better than the year prior, but still needs to be improved. I do think though, and I said this, I think maybe with Colby, I really believe the offensive line isn't as bad as what they actually are because the last how many years with the offense of scheme with Brian Ferentz, with teams just loading guys in the box because they knew what was coming. It's kind of hard to be a good offensive line when guys are just, you got eight, nine, ten guys in the box coming right at you. At that point, it's a numbers game. I think if you can be a little bit less predictable and be you know, attack more. You don't, you won't have teams and spread, spread teams out. I think the offensive line could be a little bit better. So uh, we'll leave it at that. We will now enter uh, the next kind of the second half of this episode, talking basketball, women's basketball, men's basketball, the NCAA tournament, March Madness, all those things with Tyler. So let's get right into that. All right. I got Tyler here. Now we are going to get into some basketball. We're going to start first with the men's and then we'll end with the women's. So Tyler, once again, another year, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say once again, because obviously we we've made it the tournament the last few years, but it seems like the Fran fatigue kind of has settled in again, where the lack of defense, the, um, conference tournament, the, you know, it feels like every year we always lose right away and it happened again. Yeah. We lose Ohio state, we lose to Illinois, you know, a week ago. I almost kind of felt like a, a tournament game because we needed that win. And here we are sitting here on Tuesday, and, and we got a game tonight. And we're not going to really talk much about that game because chances are people listening to this, it's going to be after that game. But we got in the NIT, yeah. which I think for a lot of people going into this season, I think that was probably the expectation. I would assume for most people, I think for me, I was kind of borderline bubble team might get in, might not. And if we don't get in NIT, so it hasn't been necessarily a bad year, but it just kind of sucks because we're playing so well there towards the end, you know, Michigan state, Northwestern, Penn state, even at Illinois, we played well. And then it all just kind of comes tumbling down. And here we are um, in the NIT. And once again, another just year of, just lack of defense and losing right away in the tournament in the conference tournament. It just, it kind of sucks. Yeah. I really like your kind of your word Fran fatigue. I, I, I think that kind of summarizes it well uh, for, for us, Iowa basketball fans, I think. And, and what that means to me is it's just kind of the same old story, right? Like that's what it means to me. Like you give yourself a chance at the end of the season and we have something right in front of us where I feel like if we, you know, we beat Illinois at least one of the two times at the end of the year, and then we, you know, compete actually in the Big Ten tournament, you give yourself a shot. Now, whether that still means that we were in or out, I don't know. Um, but you, we've talked about it on previous episodes, going back to some of those games like Maryland, Penn State, like games where you had to win. That kind of plays into the frame fatigue too. It's like, of course we lose that game. Of course we lose those games that we're supposed to win, where we have leads and we 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 don't capitalize on that, and we end up losing the game. So you just you look at it, and and yeah, I mean, it sucks. Like it just because like that's the thing. You get in the tournament. There's so much to look forward to. Like I know we haven't had success, right? That's part of friend the friend fatigue as well, where we lose right away, even if we do get into the tournament. But it's still just like it's so exciting, like. You mentioned it like the NITs tonight. No, I'll be honest. I'm not as pumped for that as obviously a, a first round game in the, the actual NCAA tournament. So, um, you know, because it's just a step down teams opt out. It's like, it's kind of like bowl, the bowl season at, in a sense where it's like players opt out teams opt out. It's like, it's not yeah. the same feeling. Right. So, um, 
but yeah, I, I don't know. Like it, it sucks because like you said, we were playing well. Uh, we were winning the games that we were supposed to win towards the end of the season, giving ourselves a, a, a shot. And then, you know, we, we don't win one of the two games. I feel like we needed to against Illinois. And sure enough, we just, we obviously or that, that second game specifically against Illinois. We couldn't have had a worse start. And it's yeah, like, it's <laughs> cool. Like, down 20 in like the first five minutes. Cool. And then Ohio state kind of like slow start back and forth all, all the way, but you don't play any defense. So you're not going to win that game. Um, and so, yeah, it's just an early exit in the big 10 tournament and it's like, Oh, great. NIT kind of what we expected. Right. Yeah. Like you said. So I don't know. It's just, it's annoying. It's like, it, you just wish you, you had the NCAA tournament to look forward to maybe, or, or, you know, just bigger, bigger goals than what, what we kind of settled for. I feel like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, my problem is those last two games, the biggest games of the year. I mean, I don't think we led once in that Illinois game. No. If you think about it. Um, and then in the Ohio state game, I know we tied it. I, we might've maybe led like really early in the game. Maybe not. I don't know, but I know we tied it at one point. And I think actually, no, we did we get up against Ohio State? I can't remember. But regardless, though, it felt like that game was like done for two by halftime. Yeah. And the Illinois game, it was like right away. And, and the problem with like the Illinois game is our defense is so bad that you're not going to get enough stops to come back. And even though we did kind of come back, we kind of crawled back, it just wasn't enough because our defense is not good to, especially against Illinois, who's who's a good team. They just won the Big Ten Championship. Yeah. You're not going to come back from that if you get down 20 some to four, 20 some to six. And, uh, and then here we are. So looking at the, the tournament, the conference tournament, the NCAA tournament. So we are now under Fran nine and 12 in conference tournament games. And if you think about it, you go back to 22 and that's when we won four games that year, um, in the conference tournament. So you minus that year where we won, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, our record under Fran in the tournament, it's not good the way it is, but it'd be even more bad. It, you know, you just go down the line like this year, one and done. Last year, one and done. It, it really sucks. And then the NCAA tournament, we're not much better. We're four and seven under Fran in the yeah. co- in the NCAA tournament. A lot of one and dones, a lot of, okay, we win that first game and then we get blown out in the second game. And uh, obviously, Everybody knows we haven't made the Sweet 16, but nine and 12, four and seven. That's like for me, like that's like I said, where the Fran fatigue kind of comes into play. I said this on the podcast I did by myself a couple weeks ago. I said, you know, I think we can all appreciate what Fran's done because that's kind of when I started following Iowa athletics, Iowa basketball when I was old enough. It, I remember those few final few years under Todd Licklider, and it was horrible. Like, so bad. And so what Fran was able to do, come in, kind of resurrect the program a little bit. But the problem is we're now in the year, what, 13, 14, and it just feels like it's the same thing. It feels like we have hit the ceiling with this um, under yeah. Fran. And it, it really just comes down to me, like the lack of defense, the lack of mm-hmm. aggressiveness on rebounding and just not having good guard play or, or in good perimeter defense. Like it all comes down to that. You see all these teams that go far in the March Madness, they have really good guard play. There's something we have always kind of lacked. Like we've always had like, Decent players like Mike Cassell, right? And, you know, Anthony Clemens, I think his name was. And, you know, Tony yeah. Perkins. But, like, never, like, elite. elite guard. Look at Iowa State, you know. Yeah. So, it's – that's where it just – it just sucks. And then, you know, like, I actually wrote down here, too, like, all, all our losses this year, we averaged in all 14 losses, um, the opponent 84 points per game. So, we've given – that was what we – average given up and that's a lot of points in the big yeah. 10 a lot of points and you know you go to that ohio state game last week there was a point in that game i think with what was it eight minutes left in the in the second half we had 62 points up on the board i think most teams in college basketball would love to have 62 points in a conference tournament like with eight minutes left in the game because it, because for most teams they're right in it they're either winning or they're right in it and here we yeah. are iowa um, 62 points. We're down by 10 points because our defense is that bad. So that's what sucks. Yeah. Yeah. The defense is, is it's never really 
there and it never really like my thing is like it just doesn't even like get better over the course of a season right like you think by like the end of the season you might be playing like your best basketball and like there were points in some of those games where we were winning where we actually decided to guard a little bit but you play these tougher teams and we just don't like there's just no emphasis on defense I, I get tired of it I, I hate it as much as I love offense I don't know if it's me watching too much Iowa football, but I I can appreciate some defense once in a while too. And <laughs> yeah, and like seriously, like there's like I don't know if Brand just doesn't care about it. I I, I texted you during the Ohio State game, and I'm like, I kind of quoted like what Fran said at halftime, and it was like he was like talking to the reporter or whatever, and he's like, yeah, uh, you know, got to defend a three the three point line a little bit better, and like at that point they were like. I don't know, seven of nine from three, they literally couldn't miss. It's like, yeah, you think we should probably decide to guard the three point line? Yep, probably. Like, like, yeah, probably. And they shot, you know, not not too much, uh, or they shot a little bit worse in the second half, but not not bad enough to obviously lose the game. So I don't know. It's just it's deep, it's the lack of defense. It's and my big thing, like, dude, like you said, it's like you you you're judged by like how you do in like the postseason. I feel like right and like yeah, we haven't done a good job. And honestly, I feel like it's I know like just a couple of years ago we won it, so I don't want to say like we're getting like worse, but it's like I just don't see the next Keegan Murray walking in the door. Like I don't know, I, or, or like, and I know he didn't start out as like a stud either. Like he he just developed that way, and and like that's great. And I'm not saying that we can't have somebody else develop like that, but. Like we've had really elite players, and and I feel like even those years, like yeah, we didn't do much. So if we don't have even that type of talent on the roster, like yeah, you might just see us not really getting too far, especially even in like the Big Ten tournament. I don't know. That's just my thoughts. I also think like like this year, you saw like the fan support dwindle down a lot. Like people weren't going to games. I really wonder what's going to happen next year, especially if like, it's kind of the same roster, right? Kind of the same core going into next year. Like, I just think like a lot of people have just kind of said in the fact where they just, they're just kind of over it. They're kind of done. And it really sucks that we've kind of gotten to that point, but I just think there's a lot that has to be done. We got to go out. We got to find some transfers. We got to, you know, this isn't a bad roster, but there's definitely holes in it. There's definitely things that we got to figure out going into next year. Another thing to me, too, like it just seems like Fran, outside of like maybe yelling at the rest from time to time, it doesn't just it just seems like he he just disengaged, disengaged with like he doesn't really get like light a fire uh, with this players I, like it used I, to like he used to get so mad at them and like which is, you know, not always a good thing, but like, you know, it. Right. it it gets him going. It just seems like he That's just a, stands there with his hands in his pocket. Yep. And he just kind of watches the game and he doesn't really. Excellent, excellent point. Know. Real quick. Don't mean to cut you off. But like I, when you brought that up right now, I was just thinking back to like, literally our last two games, obviously our most important games. You would have thought that he would have like tried to pro like provide some sort of spark for this team. Like really just like, you know, get the team going and like, seriously, hands in pockets. It's like, ah, well, I guess we lost. Oh, well, next year's I guess we'll see you next year. It's like, what? I thought the same thing. Yeah, he used to get like, you know, he'd call timeouts and just chew his players out and, yeah. you know, get under them. And think about it. Like these, those last two games, the biggest games of the year, we had like no energy, it felt like. That's what I'm saying. Like the like, Illinois game, we had a whole week off. You can't be tired. You can't be out of energy. Like you had an entire week off to prepare and you come out like that flat. Like yep. it just can't happen. It, it just can't. And, and it sucks because like that game, for example, was quote unquote a sold out game, and you finally yeah. got fans there. You got, you know, you got Patrick, you know, complaining about how the crowds have been bad this year, which, you know, he kind of has the right to say that. But then him and including the entire team come out and just lay an egg. And then you wonder why like fans don't Correct. come and support. So yeah. that's kind of where we are at with Iowa basketball. All yeah. right, let's switch gears now to March Madness a little bit. Let's talk a little bit uh, about kind of the bracket and things like that. I'm going to share the screen right now with the bracket and really the biggest thing is I think the biggest talking point is um the east region because it is very very tough I'm going to kind of zoom in a little bit I think Iowa State they got a a really bad draw and we can get into them being the last remaining second seed which is just crazy to me but 
Yeah. Yeah. They're going to have, they're going to have to go through South Dakota state, which is a former team of TJ. There's some connections there, some guys on that staff that, that were at Iowa state. So they, they have to play them and then they have to go and maybe play Drake second round and Drake's going to give it. They're all in that game. You know, it's an in-state showdown essentially. And then you get to, you know, you get to the sweet 16 and at that point, you're either going to play probably Illinois or BYU. And from the sounds of it, what I heard was, so BYU, which I apparently did not know this, BYU cannot play games on Sunday. So they had to put them where they played like Thursday, Saturday. And so they actually really? were not seated right. They shouldn't have been a six seed. They should have been more like a five seed or a four seed, but the committee couldn't get it where that would all happen. So they had wow. to put them in the six seed. So they are actually misseeded. So they could potentially beat Illinois or, you know, yeah. whoever. And right. we've seen BYU already beat Iowa State this year um, at BYU, yeah. of course. But And then you get past them, potentially. Then you're going to play either UConn or Auburn, and it's probably more than likely going to be UConn. So it's going to be tough. And not only that, but that game, if they get to the Elite Eight and they have to play UConn, that's going to be at, at Bo- in Boston, which there's yeah. going to obviously be a lot of UConn fans there considering Connecticut's like a state over. So, yeah, it's right. a tough region for Iowa State. And someone made a good point. Would they have been better off losing to Baylor the game before in the Big 12 tournament and them dropping to like the three seed and being in this region, which I just, if you're watching this on YouTube, because this region's not that tough. I mean, no. you got North Carolina, Arizona, but then a the bunch rest of. is kind of wide open. To me. Yes, a bunch of winnable games for sure. So someone made a good point there. And <laughs> for me, it's like, are we getting to the point where teams are just going to start stop caring about the conference tournament, which sucks because I love the conference tournament. I think they're, it's like a kind of a branch off to March madness. It kind of gets you kind of prepared for March madness and there's some really good games, but if they're not going to really count that, because think about Iowa state, they just beat the best team in the country. Potentially. I mean, you, you can make the argument UConn is, but Houston's right up there. Not only did they beat them, but they killed them by like 30 points. And it seemed like that meant nothing because if it meant something, they would have been either the last number one seed or they would have been the second uh, or the first number two seed, 100%. So what that tells me is that game did not matter and that essentially the only way they would have been a two seed is if they would have won the Big 12, which they didn't. So now they were a two seed, but if they would have lost like the game before, they would have been a three seed, which looking at it now, if you ask an Iowa State fan, they would have been like, ah, I kind of wish now we, you know, we're a three right. seed considering the bracket. But, you know, obviously you want to win your conference, yeah. you know, beating Houston. That's a, that's freaking awesome. And um, for them anyway, not, you know, not as an Iowa fan. But um, so, yeah, so I don't know. It's just it's. I don't know. It's like, why, you know, why not more teams do what Kansas did and just sit out, guys, get prepared for the for the for the NCAA tournament at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I kind of agree with you. I think first of all, you know, when you, when you talk about like Iowa or Iowa state kind of getting screwed over, I definitely agree. And I think, you know, I mean, take like, take for example, the same thing that happened to like Illinois, Illinois won the big 10 championship. I think they were a three seed regardless. Somebody had said whether they win it or not. Yeah. So it's like, they didn't help their stock by playing extra days, you know, and, 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 you know, playing, you know, way, you know, guys playing way more minutes and playing extra days and winning that championship. It's like, yeah, you won the big 10 championship, but it didn't, it didn't propel you to a higher seed or put you in a better position necessarily than maybe it would have, if you had lost. So I, you know, the same can be said about Illinois. I think the other thing is like, dude, UConn as the number one overall seed, that is brutal. You've got, but they have to go through the championship. (laughs) Yep who is an SEC champion, Iowa State, a Big 12 champion. Um, what's the other one? Illinois, Big 10. Illinois, Big 10 champion. Like, dude. And we'll talk about, you know, the Iowa women's having their, you know, fair share of yeah. tough games ahead of them too. But it's like, what what are we doing? Yep. Like, what are we doing here? Oh, you, you see here, <laughs> lists of the regions with the highest rate at Ken Palm for seeds one through six. And not – Number one, two, three, four, and six all reside in the East. The rest, the right. only exception is the fifth seed in the Midwest is the highest rated Ken Bond for the seeds, which is just crazy. So they literally stacked the East, said, okay, whoever comes out of the East alive, 
congratulations because you just played some really tough opponents and you're going to be well prepared to take on whoever you play in the final four in the national championship game at that point. It's just, it's crazy to me. And even, yeah, if you make it out alive, get prepared to, you know, potentially face another one seed, like you said, in the big 10 or in the championship game. So it's like, it, that's so crazy to me. Yeah, That's so crazy. And like I said, I'm not an Iowa state fan. But no, I I'm feel I I feel for them here where it's just like I don't I get I don't get I, how they are this, the eighth eighth overall. If that was team. my team, hundred percent. I'm sitting here banging the desk for for the same for the same BS that you know they're thinking right now too. Hundred yeah. percent. I mean, like they're. And what's funny is in the AP poll came out yesterday and they're yeah fourth. That's in isn't that funny? Ranking how, and then they're that, eighth. Then they're the eighth team in the tournament. It's yep. like I just Tennessee's I ahead of them who lost in the SEC tournament yep. you know marquette's ahead of them they lost they're yep. right in front of baylor who they just beat you know by they you know beat. easily i mean like i wouldn't say easily yep. but that game was never really a game i watched that entire game and they're only yep. one spot ahead of them like it just it just doesn't make much sense at all um and then like illinois for example like being 12th like you can make the case with their kind of run that they've had like they should maybe yep. be higher than that right like yep. i know the big 10 isn't or wasn't great this year but like when Illinois is hot, they are really, really tough. No, and that's what I'm saying. Like that, them winning the Big Ten championship really didn't do anything for them. It really no. didn't. It, and and we can go back to when Iowa won the Big Ten championship. Remember, we didn't get a higher seed. No, we, we didn't. Might, we, like we already we talked about. It. It's like, well, damn, maybe we should have just lost. Like we're talking yep. about with Iowa State. So, yep. And Illinois is a team too, where like for me, it's like they're good. And I like what I just said, they're good, but they, right. I could easily see them like oh. losing like right away too. They're just like that typical, like big 10 team who wins yeah. their conference championship and then just lay an egg. Like Iowa did last year, like Purdue did or Iowa two years ago, Purdue did last year. And, yeah. um, I could see Purdue laying an egg Purdue. I know for a fact, the last two years is going to be crawling behind their mind. Oh, for these sure. next two games, if they can get out of the first weekend, it, it'll be a weight lifted off their chest. And I think they'll play way more free. I, I can see them playing tense these first two games, and I could see them losing one of these first two games because of that reason. And they're not – they're. I mean, Kansas is not the same Kansas team. They're injured. Creighton's obviously pretty good. Tennessee, I'm not yeah. saying, is, is, is bad either, but that's a winnable – you know, very winnable. When you're comparing it to any of the other regions, comparing it to the East, it's like, man, very winnable. Yep, it is. And – um. What or no? Yeah, Houston's in the South. Okay, yeah. So Houston, Houston. Yeah. I, I filled out my bracket. and I had Houston. Who did I have my final four? I think I had UConn, Houston. I want to say I, I maybe had Crane or Tennessee in the Midwest, and then I had, I think North Carolina. I know it's like had all number one seeds, but yeah, um, it's like hard not to pick them. Yeah, you don't want to. It's but, it's hard to predict the type of upsets that are are, are bound yeah. to happen. For sure. I usually, when I pick upsets, I'm usually picking the 12th seed against the five or yeah. like the 11th seed against the six. And yeah. then every year there's always that, you know, 13 seed over yeah. a three seed or 15 seed over a two seed. It always happens at least once a year. So we'll see what, see what happens, what madness brings us here. And just judging from the conference tournaments and some of the, the upsets, the losses, I think this year is going to be crazy. I think there's going to be a lot oh. of upsets. There's going to be a lot of close games. There's going to be a lot of madness going on. So I'm really excited for that. And then last yeah. but not least, talking about the tournament is the bubble teams because I, yeah, man, Indiana State a of, yeah. got, at, for me, got screwed over. I mean, if oh, 100%. It, it came down to the brand, I mean, Virginia oh, yeah. brand, you know, and it, it pisses me off because it's like, I think Indiana state is a much, I want to say a much better team than Virginia, but they are a better team net ranking. They're 29 Virginia's 54 and Indiana state yep. would have gave you a better game. Like they would have gave like whoever they play against, like it would be a good game. Like Virginia, they don't have any offense. It's going it, to like, I think they play tonight. They play Colorado state tonight. I'm sure. That game's going to end in like the fifties or the forties. <laughs> like, I don't know. Just annoys well, me. I, Indiana State's the highest net team to never make it to the tournament. That's to me, that's like a like insane. Yeah. I was so, su I was surprised that like seeing Hall like potential or you know, like that, oh, that yeah. was another team Same, that was kind of you know, yep. you know, I think they God, who are some of their I mean, they there were some 
they had some good wins this year too. So yeah, it just didn't really make much sense. Uh, St. John's was another team that was left out. Although yep. for them, I was a little bit more like there was a point where like they lost like eight out of their 10 games. And like there was yeah. parts during the season when Patino was like calling out his team yep. saying that they weren't like athletic oh, yeah. or something. So it's just like, okay, like, yeah, they kind of finished the year strong, but like, I don't really like think like, okay, yeah, they deserved it. Like Indiana state for me was the one where it's like, they deserve to be in like they deserve now for a while there when Iowa was still a bubble, I obviously was like, no, I want Iowa in there. But like now, well, ever since Iowa was like no longer in, like that was a team I was like, yeah, they deserve to be in for sure. So, um, Did and you, then my, my question was going to be, do you ever think Iowa really had a chance considering kind of no, the way I think played out? I think even if they would have beat Illinois and then like won yeah. one game in the big 10 tournament, I don't think they even make it then either. I think the way it all played out, all the upsets, you had teams like North Carolina State that wouldn't have made it if they wouldn't have beat North Carolina, but they did. Yep. So that was another spot. I don't think they would have. I think I felt a lot. I felt a lot better after it all happened because I was like, okay, well, now I know. Even if we would have won those for those couple games, we probably still wouldn't have made it. So, um, right. And then this is just a chart that I actually saw on Twitter, which I thought was kind of interesting. It laid out all the teams, all the top 10 seeds in this tournament. And the top right is like really good offense, really good defense. Bottom left is really bad offense, really bad defense. And then, you know, obviously the top, you know, top left and top or bottom right. But the dots are like the last, I think 20 year champions. So as you could see, most of them reside in obviously the good offense, good defense. Thought it was interesting. They circled last year's past champion and that was uh, uh, UConn, right? UConn yeah. won last year, yeah. So last yeah. year, like they had really good defense. Offense was slightly back. Look at where the team that's closest to that, Iowa State. So if you're an Iowa State fan listening, you have a good shot. Um, pretty much what this tells you is us Iowa fans are screwed in the tournament because oh, yeah. the bottom right, good offense, bad defense, never wins you a championship. Unless that one, there was that one dot right there that was, but that's like, extremely good offense like you're on the way yeah it's the same thing with like the ken palm rankings like they don't lie like that's a legit thing like you need a good offense you need a good defense you need to you know be you pretty good in both areas and like i think it's like something with the last 25 years only one team like didn't have one of the two like a top whatever defense or offense and actually won and it's like it just it doesn't happen very often mm-hmm. yeah you're right it, i was screwed we play zero defense yep. you're, you're not going because you kind of have games like in the tournament where your offense struggles and you got to play you got to you got to you got to play defense and we can't guard so yep. not under fran anyway so pretty much what this chart tells you is there's essentially Six-ish teams, Iowa yeah. State, Tennessee, North Carolina, Arizona, Yukon, Auburn, and Houston have the best shot just looking at the average because that's kind of where most of the dots reside. Anything else, anything bottom left or bottom right, you might like ho- – hopefully you guys don't pick those as your tournament winners because just judging from trends, it ain't going to happen, especially if those teams reside in the bottom uh, left corner. So, um, yeah. just thought that was interesting and I'm definitely yeah. going to save this when I'm, uh, predicting my games because yeah, you'll have to, uh, it definitely, this again. <laughs> um, I think like you said, it can, it doesn't lie. The da- data does not lie. And looking at this too, cause I did not realize like Auburn was as good as like kind of what this is showing, you know, good offense, good defense that UConn Auburn game. If it gets to that, that's going to be a oh, hell yeah. of a game. It's gonna be a really good game. So, all right, yeah. let's get into the women's bracket now and talk a little, Iowa women's um, we were really excited there for a brief second that we got the number one seed, but then shortly after that, we figured out, wow, our, our uh, side is pretty tough, but you know what? We got Caitlin Clark on our side. You know, we got a a team that, that is gritty that I think can do it. I think we can get back to the final four. It's just, it's going to be really tough. It's going to be really tough to say the least. Yeah. I, uh, you know, it's, it's great. We, we got the one seed, something that, you know, it's been a long time since Iowa had done that, whether it's men's or women's. I don't even know if the men's have had a one seed, to be honest. But um, it's been, yeah, it was it was really exciting. And then they started revealing the teams. I'm like, holy shit. I mean, you've got, 
I mean, the top four is crazy, right? Like you've got Iowa, uh, UCLA, LSU, and then Kansas State. I mean, yep. Kansas State's no slouch. We played them twice already and had lost one time. So they're going to be a tough team. It's cr- Someone was saying it's like, they're like, they kind of messed that up. They should not be playing like a third time, like right now anyway. Like a, they should not be yeah, in the same like, bracket, which – so I just don't understand it. But some some of the rankings I don't understand, but um, where where teams are placed at. But, yeah, the, I was going to have to earn it, that's for sure. To get back to the Final Four and, and potentially a national championship game, th- they'll be going through a gauntlet. I will say they're, the upper half is definitely not as hard as that like bottom, right? No, and LSU yes, and, for sure. And, LSU and UCLA are definitely going to have to play each other before, you know, only one of them. I will only have to play one of them if we, you know, get that far. Um, You know, just looking at it, obviously Kansas State, Colorado, we had to play last year. They're a pretty good team. Um, You know, they, you know, they played us, played us tough last year. That's the thing. They could, they could easily beat Kansas State too. So, you know, we're all talking, oh, you know, third time, but Colorado could beat them. So it like, you know. Yeah. So that top half is, is not as brutal as that bottom. That's for sure. Three good news things I was like. Number one, we're not on the South Carolina side. So if we do yeah. make it as far, if we face South Carolina, that means we're in the national championship game, which is awesome. Right. That's number one. Right. Number yeah. two, the first two games are in Iowa City. So that's 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 awesome, right? Like we're gonna good have point. the fan support. Um, yeah. you know, we should take care of business. And then yeah, like number three, like you just mentioned, UCLA and LSU, if they get like they're gonna have to play each other. So we're not gonna play both both of those teams. We're not gonna play both Colorado and Kansas State. Like they're gonna play each other and yep. we'll just have to play whoever is remaining. And well, and that's if we obviously make it all the way. But what this bracket side tells me is that just kind of like maybe like the I or maybe like the men's were you know, they tried to schedule kind of like those matchups, the drama, right? Like Nebraska, Texas A&M, and the men's and the women's for like Trev Alberts. Yeah. You look at this, like LSU, if they win, they play oh, for Haley sure. Van List's former team in Louisville, right? You got yeah. Iowa, yeah. Kansas State. That's kind of a storyline they've played, right? Yeah. Iowa, LSU. So they oh, definitely do sure. these things on purpose to get the best matchups, to get the best storylines. Um kind of box office things right and so yeah this is a perfect bracket for that and um but so what would you percentage wise place iowa getting back to the final four i don't know that's it's that's a tough question i think like i don't know i think it's gonna be tough i really do i think it's gonna be tough obviously they're a one seed um you know they're probably going to be favored in most of these games I, i would imagine um, it really just comes down to if Caitlin Clark can get some help like she did in the Big Ten tournament. Yep. I think that really, to me, is going to be the biggest key. I, I mean, I hate to cop – this is basically a cop-out answer, but, I mean, I I could go 25 30% to get to the national championship. I think it's going to be tough. I really yep. do. LSU is going to be a hard matchup for Iowa if, if and when they play that game. I don't even know if they'd be favored. It's Who's because guard like Angel Reese. Yeah, LSU so like they're kind of bigger, right? More they're like bigger, a, yeah, and they tougher have a lot team. of pieces. It's, they don't, yeah. they don't, they're not just one player. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So like, I think that's a really tough game. I don't know much about UCLA. I know they're obviously really good. Um, I I would probably I play I UCLA. Would say 30, Oh, I would too. Just because we, LSU's already played us, they know how to, you know, well, they know how like, to defend Caitlin. They've played us yeah. before. They're aware. They also, I mean, go look, look at that SEC championship game. I mean, it, it's going to be like a hard, like it's going to be a physical game. And I, yep. that's just kind of like SEC basketball, I feel like, women's basketball. So I don't like that for Iowa. If if you're telling me I get to play UCLA in the Elite Eight, I'll probably go 40%, 45% chance. But right now I'd probably sit at like 30% to get back. I think it's gonna be tough. Yeah. A lot of pressure if, on Caitlin Clark, right? All the pressure, everything, everything is stacked against Iowa. Yep. Ever since that Indiana game, the on the road when we got blown out, the, the team has definitely responded and has been helping Caitlin Clark out. You look at the Big Ten tournament, Caitlin Clark looked awful some of those, like the first half. Like let's let's yeah, you know, and sure. um if it wasn't for really the the other the team surrounding her, like who knows what have happened? Like the Penn State game, she didn't do anything in the first half, and we were up by so much. So like, yeah, if you get the supporting cast to step up like they did, I'm feeling really good. But you just yeah. never know. And the defense needs to obviously step up. The you know down low, 
they got to yeah. be able to, you know, make their layoffs, defend, yeah. rebound, things like that. It will be tough. It's going to be tough, but I'm excited. I think this team should definitely at least get to the Sweet 16, right? Definitely get to the I second think weekend. So. I think and that's the um, lore. Yeah. everything sure. will just be kind of up for that. And yeah, I, I hope we go far because like we mentioned with Iowa men's, you know, we didn't make the tournament this year. So something to kind of look forward to. And at least we got that. So, um, yeah, that's really it. Obviously didn't really spend much time on the women's. I just kind of wanted to show the bracket for Iowa and, sure. um, yeah, let's, let's hope that Caitlin Clark can do her thing. Not many more games left to watch her in no, the Hawkeye man. uniform. Cherish so it. you got to cherish it. So, well, that will do it for this episode. We're going to watch the Iowa game tonight. Hopefully we win. Like I said, we're recording this before, so tough we don't know. State. It's yep. it's going to be a tough matchup. And, you know, talk about like just like matchup wise. I mean, it's probably one of the better NIT matchups. Iowa, Kansas State, Big Ten, for Big sure. 12. So oh, yeah. um, I'm excited. Let's hope we win. I mean, I obviously yeah. I want to go far in that. I mean, I know it's NIT, but it's like I don't want to just lose right away either. Like I want to be able yeah. to watch more games for Iowa, too. So, but. All right, well, that will do it for this episode. Thank you guys all for listening. We'll be back shortly. Football starting up, so we'll get back into that in full swings of things with spring practice and things like that. So till then, have a good rest of your week, and go Hawks.